Hello, Britlet. This is the discussion for chapters three and four um, of your. You need to have your Jane Eyre questions out, and it'll probably be better if you actually have um, the book out as well. But definitely have your questions out because you do need to go over and fill in uh, the correct answers as we go while we're discussing the chapters. Um, you should. Uh, have read chapters 3 and 4 on Wednesday, so you should be listening to this uh, chapter discussion on Thursday, March 19th. Okay, so let's get going. Um, remember that chapter 2 had ended where Jane had, had passed out. We decided she probably had had some sort of severe panic attack or something that, that actually made her lose consciousness. So when she comes to, when she when she regains consciousness, it kind of takes her a minute to realize where she is. Uh, she finally realizes that she is in her bed up in the nursery. And um, I think we've talked about this before, but in England in this time, um, all children up until the age of about 12 or 13 would have slept upstairs in a nursery, kind of an open area with, a, with mini beds. Um, and the, the nurse or the nanny would stay up there with them until they were old enough to have their own bedroom. So, um, she's up in the nursery, and it's nighttime, and she uh, is near a fire. She can see the grate of the fire. And um, when she finally kind of, like, really gets her wits about her, she can see that Bessie is at the foot of the bed and that a gentleman is sitting in a chair right near her pillow. It's so sad to me that then she says, I felt an inexpressible relief, a soothing conviction of protection and security when I knew that there was a stranger in the room, an individual not belonging to Gateshead and not related to Mrs. Reed. So that just tells you how miserable she is there at Gateshead. I mean, imagine when you were 10 years old, if you wake up at night, especially after already having some sort of horrible fright, and there's a stranger in the room, it, you'd be terrified. You know, I mean, that, that's the normal reaction. But Jane um, is, you know, has such a bad situation there with the people um, at Gateshead that she actually feels better. She feels comforted the fact that there's a stranger there. Um, I think that's really sad. And she realizes pretty quickly that the stranger is Mr. Lloyd, who is a local apothecary. She mentions that, which of course is like a an old-fashioned sort of pharmacist. She mentions that um, he is usually called for the servants if Mrs. Reed or John, Georgiana, or Eliza get sick, they call an actual physician. So again, one more way that Jane is not treated like the other children. So, he starts asking her some questions about what happened, and at first, while Bessie's there, Bessie's trying to jump in, you know, and answer those questions. Um, not sure why. Maybe she doesn't want Mrs. Reed to get in trouble. Maybe she doesn't want herself to get in trouble. She doesn't really want it to come out, you know, how they've been actually treating Jane. It reminds me of what we were talking about the other day when y'all were telling me about that Netflix um, show about that boy that was being abused at home, and so yeah, she seems to be sort of almost sort of trying to protect Mrs. Reed. So finally, uh, but Jane's not letting her do it. Um, uh, you know, like he says what happened, and um, she says that you know, Bessie's like, oh, she just fell down, and she's like, no, I didn't fall down. Uh, so <laughs> she's she's really not not letting her go for that. So, um, she uh, asks Bessie that night, is anything wrong with her, and is she going to die? And she's like, no, you probably just felt sick. But it scares her because then when Bessie, Bessie actually goes and gets another maid to come in there with her to sleep because she said she's scared Jane might die. Jane hears her say that, so it's freaking her out even more. So, again, when Mr. Re uh, Mr. Lloyd is there the next day and talking to her, um, she is explaining how she's miserable there, and she doesn't she doesn't really like Gateshead. She's not treated well. He at first is, you know, sort of shocked by this. Um, Gateshead is a very nice house. Jane is is fed. She's clothed. She's housed. Um, so he's kind of shocked to hear that she's as miserable as she is, and that she appears to be suffering. 
from emotional abuse. And so he asks her, does she have any relatives on her dad's side? Um, and she says, no, they haven't really told her much about, you know, her, her family. She said, Mrs. Reed said if she did have any, they were probably poor. And he said, well, do you want to go try to live with them? Do you know if they're working people? And she says, no, because in her mind, you know, she has a very small frame of reference. So in her mind, poor means homeless, you know, and she doesn't want to be homeless. And so she says, no. And he said, well, what about school? And she knows that John Reed hates school. And Bessie has talked about how school is very strict, but she's also told her about how the girls that she used to be a, a nanny for um, enjoyed the school and learned a lot of interesting things, uh, how to paint, all of that. And so she's like, well, yeah, that school sounds pretty good. I'd like to do that. And so uh, Mr. Lloyd's like, well, you never know. So um, she hears later on Abbott and Bessie talking, and it's the first time she's ever really gotten any kind of background for her own story. She uh, says... Let's see, she learns from Miss Abbott's communications to Bessie that my father had been a poor clergyman, that my mother had married him against the wishes of her friends and family who considered the match beneath her, that my grandfather Reed was so irritated at her disobedience he cut her off without a shilling, and that after my mother and father had been married a year, the, letter, the latter caught the typhus fever while visiting among the poor of a large manufacturing town where his curate curacy was situated, and where that disease was then prevalent, and that my mother took the infection from him, and both died within a month of each other. So, um, she finally learns a little bit more about her family. Her dad was a preacher, um, and her mom married him against the wishes of everybody else, because obviously the Reed family is rather wealthy, and, um, Jane's father was a poor minister, and so, you know, they didn't want her to to marry, but she did anyway, so she was cut off, and so that's why her family, you know, obviously kind of uh, lived a, a poorer life, but they died when Jane was just a year old, so she doesn't have any memory of her parents at all. Um, so that's chapter three, and I've only put one question there, because it mainly is just sort of going through the aftermath of Jane's ordeal in the Red Room. So, uh, the question for chapter 3 says, Most readers of today are familiar with the signs of child abuse, emotional abuse, and neglect. While these terms were arguably unknown to Bronte in the mid-19th century, how does her treatment of Jane reflect what we know about them? And they did. They really didn't even have these terms. You know, they didn't... They really... I mean, you could beat your child. You could, you know, neglect them. You could do all kinds of things. And there was no term. There was no defects. There was nothing to try to, you know, step in... Um, to protect a child. And so we can tell, you know, living in the age that we do now, that she's obviously being neglected and suffering from emotional abuse, but that's something that, in that time period, they would not have been very aware of. So I think it says a lot about Mr. Lloyd that he did seem to recognize that Jane was truly miserable, and um, we do get the feeling that he went to speak with Mrs. Reed about possibly sending her to school, just to kind of get her out of the house. So, um, I think that says a lot for him. Okay, so, whoops, uh, so chapter four, let me erase that and move this up. Let's see, it's not letting me click on the little hand to move it up. Okay. Interesting. Oh, because it's going to go to the side. Okay, sorry, I did it a different way this time. So, chapter 4 starts out, um, and she talks about how she had some hope that perhaps she would have a change coming up. She would get to go to school, and uh, but for a long time, nothing happened. Days and weeks passed. Mrs. Reed would glare at her, but that's about it. Um and she sort of separated her children even more from Jane. She put Jane in a small little room to sleep by herself. And Jane has to stay up in the nursery all day, whereas um, her cousins go downstairs to the drawing room. Um, so Eliza and Georgiana spoke to her as little as possible. John kind of keeps wanting to pick on her a little bit, but she's just not having it anymore. So when he sticks his tongue out at her or, or tries to hit her, she immediately fights back. And he goes to tell his mom, 
and she said he says that nasty Jane Eyre had flown at him like a mad cat. And Mrs. Reed says, don't talk to me about her. I told you not to go near her. She is not worthy of notice. I do not choose that either you or your sister should associate with her. And she leans over the banister <laughs> up off the stairs and says, they are not fit to associate with me. Of course, Mrs. Reed comes running up there and um, pushes her down on the bed and um, tells her to hush. But then she still fights back, even against Mrs. Reed. She's like, what would my uncle say if he was alive? What would my parents say? They're watching you from heaven. And uh, really seems to kind of uh, shake Mrs. Reed for a little while. She's a little bit shook there. But uh, she, she does regain herself and uh, says boxes her ears. So I guess basically like hits her around the head. So November, December, and January, most of January pass away. Um, she talks about how during Christmas she is very much shut away from everybody else, which she's really kind of okay with. She doesn't want to be around Mrs. Reed and her cousins, but she does want somebody. She wishes that Bessie would stay with her more often, but Bessie usually goes downstairs to hang out with the other servants and socialize with them. Um, she's got a little doll that she takes care of and, you know, hugs next to her. Said every once in a while Bessie would come up and bring her something for dinner. So, I mean, it's very sad and depressing little childhood she's got going there. Um, but the times that Bessie's nice to her or when she's taking care of the doll, she feels like things are, you know, not too horrible. So it was the middle of January and, um... She was doing her chores up in the nursery and was trying to feed a little, some birds. She saw it there with some crumbs that she had left over from breakfast. When Bessie comes rushing in and is like, have you washed your face? You know, get on a clean um, dress. What's going on? And so she hurriedly gets her ready and tells her she's got to go downstairs um, to Mrs. Reed. And so it's been so long since she's gone down there that she feels really scared of going in. She has no idea why she's been summoned downstairs. And so when she finally goes in, there's this really tall man dressed all in black. And um, Mrs. Reed tells her to approach, and she goes up, and he starts kind of talking about her like she's not there. Like, her size is small. What is her age? And Mrs. Reed says 10 years, and he's like, so much? And then he talks to her and says, what's your name? And she says, Jane Eyre. And he says, well, Jane Eyre, are you a good child? And Mrs. Reed jumps in and is like, oh, well, the best, the, the less said on that, the better. Um, and so he tells her to come there. And I guess he's kind of, um, it's kind of like an interview. Because he's the, the guy who runs this school that Mrs. Reed is thinking about sending her. And so he's asking her, does she read her Bible? And, you know, is she good? And... Um, he asks her what happens to wicked children, and she said they go to hell. And he says, well, what what do you want to do to avoid going to hell? And she said, I have to keep in good health and not die. <laughs> so that's the answer to that first question there. Um, I must keep in good health and not die. And he reminds her that children die all the time. Super cheerful guy. And um, <laughs> so... He, he continues questioning her. He asks about, does she like to read the Bible? And she says that she likes parts of it. And if you notice the ones, the parts she said, Revelations, Book of Daniel, Genesis, Samuel, Exodus, it's all the exciting parts. You know, Jonah. It's all the stuff that's the stories um, that they usually do in Sunday school. You know, that's the exciting stories. There's a lot going on. Noah parting the Red Sea. You know, stuff like that. She likes that. She doesn't like the other parts. And so he's like, don't you like Psalms? Um, which, if you're not familiar, is, is um, the book of Psalms is basically like a book of poems. They can be sung as songs or they can be read as poetry. Um, and she's like, no, they're boring. I don't like those. <laughs> and uh, he says, well, then you're wicked. I have a little boy who knows all these Psalms by heart. And if you ask him what he would rather have... Um, a psalm to memorize, or, or a verse of a psalm to learn, or a gingerbread nut to eat, which is just a cookie. It's like a little gingerbread cookie. Um, he says, oh, a verse of psalm. Angels sing psalms. I want to be an angel here below. And then he gets two cookies. And so that's the question I've got there for number two. How does the anecdote, which is just a little story, of the little psalm angel heighten our contempt for Brocklehurst? Um, okay, where's the rest of the questions? Um, 
Hmm. Okay. Looks like this method probably didn't work. Hang on. Okay. Pick him back up. So, question number two. How does the anecdote of the little psalm angel heighten our contempt for Brocklehurst? Um, basically, we realize he's being played. I mean, his kid knows that if he says, you know, that he'd rather learn a psalm, he's going to get two cookies. Um, he is 100% being played, and he's not even aware of it. So that heightens our content. That makes him feel even more like we don't like this guy. Like you don't get a good feeling about him. And so then uh, Mrs. Reed goes into this long diatribe about how Jane is very deceitful, and she needs to be watched, and, you know, they got to keep a close eye on her, and she wants her brought up in a manner fitting her station. In other words, that she's going to have to work. And uh, she's horrified. And, and you can totally imagine this. Like, you're getting ready to leave GMC. Just imagine if wherever you're going next, whatever, college or, you know, military, whatever your next steps are, if, you know, we called from GMC and we're like, let me tell you a list of everything that this kid ever did that was wrong. You know, you're like, what? No, this is my clean slate. You know, you want a fresh start. You don't want to drag all that stuff with you. And um, so that's how Jane feels. And furthermore, what Mrs. Reed is saying she's doing is not even true. So that makes it even worse. Um, and so he believes Mrs. Reed completely, though. He's like, we'll keep a close eye on her. And um, gives Jane this little storybook, a child's guide that talks about death of children and all that. They did not coddle children in the Victorian era like we do today. Um, and so he, he gives her that to read and says he'll see her at school soon. So um, she's just kind of left there with Mrs. Reed after he leaves. And she um, just stands there. Mrs. Reed tells her to leave and she won't. And so she finally just marches up to her and um, speaks her mind. She says, you know, I'm not deceitful. I am, uh, I tell the truth. If I did, if I was a liar, I'd say I'd love you and I don't love you. <laughs> so, you know, she just goes completely into it. She said, I'll never forget how you've treated me. I'll never call you aunt. Um, you're hard hearted. You're deceitful. And it seems like she really kind of frightens Mrs. Reed. And, and you have to remember, you can tell from the reaction of Mrs. Reed and Bessie that up until this time, Jane has been so timid and so fearful, and like anybody looks at her wrong, and she kind of shrinks away, you know, um, which has made everybody even more aggravated with her. Um, and now she's like a different person. She's just, you know, turned over a new leaf. Like, no, she's going to speak up for herself. And so Mrs. Reed is, is shocked. It's almost like she feels like Jane's been taken over by a demon or something. Like, who is this child speaking to me like this? Um... And so this is number four, how we see her passionate nature in this chapter. She just lets Mrs. Reed have it. And eventually Mrs. Reed says, I will indeed send her to school soon and gets up and leaves. And she's left there alone. Like she's the victor, you know, Mrs. Reed left. Um, and at first that feels great. And then after a little while, she starts to feel bad about it. Um, number three, what's ironic about Brocklehurst's desire for consistency? On that part, he was talking about how he believed that, you know, you must be consistent in how you raise children. And, um, and he says that whenever he, ta he goes to the school, to Lowood School, he thinks all the girls should be brought up in humility. And her, his own personal children, said, Oh, dear Papa, how quiet and plain all the girls at Lowood look with their hair combed behind their ears and their long pinafores and those little holland pockets outside their frocks. They almost look like poor people's children. They looked at my dress and mama's as if they'd never seen a silk gown before. So he's trying to say that he believes in consistency in how you raise children, but he's raising his own children completely differently from how the children at Lowood in this orphan school are being, um, you know, brought up. So that's, that's that part there. And, of course, Mrs. Reed jumps on the bandwagon, too. It's like, oh, yes, consistency. That's very important. And as we've seen the whole time, she's not consistent either. Um, she treats Jane very differently from how she treats her own um, extremely spoiled children. So, um, after she finally leaves the breakfast room, she goes out into the garden, and Bessie comes to call her and bring her to lunch. 
and uh, she's not scared of Bessie anymore. And Bessie in particular seems to have really disliked the aspect of Jane's character where uh, Jane would would always, you know, almost like shrink away every time she spoke harshly to her. Um, and so Bessie really likes this new Jane who is, is more open and more friendly you know, Jane comes running up and says, um, come on, Bessie, don't scold. You know, just much more, um, much more outgoing. And Bessie really likes that. And so she says, aren't you going to be sorry to leave me uh, when you go to school? And she says, what do you care? You're always scolding me. And she says, that's because you're such a queer, frightened, shy little thing. You should be bolder. So see, that's what she's trying to tell her. Like, you need to stand up for yourself. Um, because if you're always, like, cringing away anytime anybody looks at you, then people aren't going to like you. She's trying to explain to Jane, basically, that um, Jane's going to have to be more confident if she wants to make a good impression on people when she goes to school. Um, and so she says that uh, she's got to go. They need to go inside because they're going to pack Jane's trunk because Mrs. Reed is going to um, send her from Gateshead in a day or two. So, you know, she is very ready to send her off to school now. And so she says, Bessie, you must promise not to scold me anymore till I go. And she says, well, I will, but mind you're a very good girl and don't be afraid of me. Don't start when I chance to speak rather sharply. It's so provoking. So again, that's what she's saying. Like, when I speak, at, when I speak to you, don't, like, you know, shrink away like you're terrified because it's aggravating. And she says, I don't, I won't be afraid of you, Bessie. I've soon got a whole nother set of people to dread, uh, or, which means to be scared of. And she says, but if you dread them, they'll dislike you. Um, and so she's really trying to give her, give her that um, confidence, you know, discussion before she sends her off to school. And so um, they head back in. And that evening, Bessie told her some of the sweetest stories and sang some of the sweetest songs. So, um, you know, you really see Jane uh, appreciating Bessie at this point. And so number five is asking, why does Bessie begin to treat Jane with kindness? Um, again, I think it's because Jane is acting more confidently. She's not shrinking away and being terrified every time Bessie talks to her. And Bessie likes um, that side of Jane a lot more. And then number six, what lesson does Jane learn on how, in, how, how to deal with people she fears? Um, that's what Bessie was trying to tell her. You know, you have to stand up for yourself and be confident. And that's certainly what she's learned with John and Mrs. Reed. She's been terrified of her cousin John and of Mrs. Reed her entire life. But now she has stood up, you know, in an earlier chapter to John and in this chapter to Mrs. Reed. And she's realized that they back down. And that she's being treated better. She's going to get sent to school. They're leaving her alone. You know, all of this. And so that's a, a big revelation for her. Of, oh, okay, maybe I do need to stand up for myself. Um, and that's unusual for the Victorian time period because children of this time were supposed to be seen and not heard. They were supposed to be little angels, you know. Um, and we have the example there from the little psalm angel, you know, Brocklehurst's son and the girls of the school. But Jane's learning that even though she, she's always tried to do that, and it's gotten her nowhere. It's gotten her, you know, hated and, and abused and all of this. And so she's realizing that, you know, maybe she needs to do the reverse and she needs to stand up for herself. And that's actually going to... Um, going to have her treated much better. So it's a big revelation, and it's very different from what she's always been brought up to believe. Okay, so um, that's chapters three and four, and you should have been able to go through and correct your questions there as well. Remember, please, please, please try to type the questions into the Word documents. If you got my email today, I went on and sent the rest of the questions in separate Word documents for the rest of the week. Um, so that you could just really easily open them, type in your responses, and upload them to turn it in. That's by far the fastest and easiest way to check them, so let's try to make that work, okay? Email me if you have any questions. Have a good one.